Hey everyone, so we're back at it with Unit 8, and we are going to cover Chapter 12, The Heart, today, which covers four sections in the textbook. The heart plays a very major role in the cardiovascular system, obviously, and our body cells rely on the surrounding interstitial fluid for oxygen, nutrients, and waste disposal. The circulating blood is actually what keeps these conditions stable, and the blood is pumped by our heart. Our heart beats approximately 100,000 beats per day and is a large workload for a very small organ that's about the size of your clenched fist. Now the blood flows through vessels between the heart and peripheral tissues. Uh, those vessels are divided into two circuits, the pulmonary, which carries blood to and from the lungs, and the systemic, which transports blood to and from the rest of the body. Both of them begin and end at the heart. Um, the blood vessels, and so terms you need to be familiar with, arteries are the efferent vessels that carry blood away, our veins are the afferent vessels that return blood, and while our capillaries are small thin-walled vessels between the smallest arteries and smallest veins, they're going to exchange nutrients, gases, and waste products between blood and the surrounding tissues. The heart is also made up of four muscular chambers that we'll talk more about later, the right atrium, right ventricle, the left atrium, left ventricle, pay specific attention to what, what they do with blood. Now here is an image of the pulmonary circuit which is in a lighter blue and red and they, they are the circuit that's comprised here and then your systemic circuit is the darker red and blue which you see going through here. And remember they both uh, start and end at the heart and they work together. Now, the heart is a four-chambered organ, like we just mentioned. It's supplied by coronary circulation, and it pumps oxygen-poor blood to the lungs and oxygen-rich blood to the rest of the body. Um, the heart lies near the interior chest walls directly behind the sternum. It's enclosed by the mediastium, which is connective tissue mass between the two pleural cavities. It also contains the great vessels, which are your largest arteries and veins, your thymus, esophagus, and your trachea. Now the heart is surrounded by the pericardial cavity. The lining of that cavity is known as a serous membrane called the pericardium. And it's easy to distinguish these features if you think about your fist being pushed into a balloon. And the base of the heart is right here where your wrist would be. And so it's actually right here on the heart. And then the uh, apex of the heart is kind of where your knuckles would be. And that inner wall is going to be the visceral, or closest to the organ pericardium, while the outer wall is a parietal pericardium. And then in between, which will be like where the air space is for the balloon, is that pericardial cavity, protecting the heart. Now the surface anatomy of the heart, we're not going to talk a whole bunch right about right now, since we're going to do a dissection in class. It's going to help you with this, but go ahead and draw a sketch in your notes. At a minimum, I would label the ventricles, the atria, which is uh, plural for atrium, and then aorta and the vena cava. The heart wall has three distinct layers. The epicardium covers the outer surface, myocardium, the muscular wall of the heart, and the endocardium, which is a simple squamous epithelium with underlying areolar tissue that covers the heart's inner surfaces. Use the prefixes to remember where they are. Um, the cardiac muscle cells make up the muscle tissue of the heart, and they connect at those intercalated discs we talked about um, earlier in the year. Uh, those discs are going to aid in pulling together for pumping efficiency. Now the connective tissue of the heart includes an abundance of collagen and elastic fibers. They wrap around each cardiac muscle cell to tie them together. And what they're going to do is support the cardiac muscle fibers, blood vessels, and nerves. Uh, they're going to add strength and prevent overexpansion of the heart, help the heart return to a normal strength after a contraction, and they also form the cardiac skeleton, which we'll talk about more here shortly. Now, taking a look inside the heart's anatomy, which again we will look at more in depth in our dissection, but you need to make sure you can identify the right and left atria and the ventricle. So here's your right atrium, your left atrium, uh, your right ventricle, and your left ventricle. Um, the right atrium receives blood from the superior vena cava, which is up here, um, the inferior vena cava, and the coronary sinus, which you can see the opening right here. The fossa ovalis is a small depression that persists from where the fossa ovale once existed during embryonic development. If this remains open, it could cause heart enlargement, failure, and death if not detected and surgically repaired. Um, blood travels from the atria to the ventricles by cusps. You can see uh, some cusps here. Uh, they're also known as flaps, and they are part of each valve. Uh, the red arrows here are going to indicate oxygenated blood. The blue arrows indicate deoxygenated blood, which makes sense because um, you can see pulmonary veins, red arrow, pulmonary meaning they have reached the lungs carrying oxygen. Um, and just another note, the superior vena cava brings blood from the head, neck, and upper limbs and chest, while the inferior vena cava 
uh, brings uh, blood from the rest of the trunk, the viscera, and the lower limbs. All right, our heart valves include the atrioventricular valves or the AV valves. They prevent the backflow or regurgitation of blood from the ventricles into the atria. Um, in a normal person, they could have a small amount of regurgitation at times, which results in a heart murmur, which would be something that would need to be kind of watched if that was happening relatively frequently. Uh, the semilunar valves include the pulmonary and aortic. They prevent backflow from the pulmonary trunk and the ascending aorta into the right and left ventricles, respectively. They do not require muscular bracing like the AV valves do. Now, before we talk about the cardiac skeleton, this is showing you the different valves. So you have your right AV valve and you have your left. Um, you have your aortic valve right here and then your pulmonary valve here. And you can see that when the AV valves are open, um, the aortic and pulmonary valves are closed and vice versa. And this is an actual real life picture of those. Um, that cardiac skeleton is actually located right here in between the valves because they stabilize the position of the heart valves. They physically isolate the atrial muscle tissue from the ventricular muscle tissue and allows for timing and controlled contractions. Now the blood supply to the heart is very important because the heart is working continuously. Those cardiac cells are in constant need of oxygen and nutrients, which are supplied by that coronary circulation. Um, if there is an area of dead tissue caused by an interruption of blood flow, we call that an infarct. And a myocardial infarction, which is otherwise known as a heart attack, is when the coronary circulation becomes blocked. Cardiac muscle cells die from the lack of oxygen, which is normally a result of uh, coronary ar artery disease, a condition characterized by the buildup of fatty deposits in the walls of our arteries. Now, moving on to 12-2, we're going to talk about these specialized cells that help us produce a heartbeat. And in a single heartbeat, the entire heart, which includes the atria and the ventricles, contracts in a very coordinated manner so that the blood flows in the correct direction at the proper time. Each individual cardiac muscle contracts with each heartbeat, and there are two types of cells involved, contractile cells, which produce powerful contractions, uh, non-contractile cells of the conducting system that actually control and coordinate the activities of the contractile cells. So 99% um, of all cardiac muscle cells are contractile cells, um, and both cardiac, skele cardiac and skeletal muscle cells and action potential leads to calcium, if you remember, binds a troponin on the thin filaments, and then we get a contraction. The only difference is in the cardiac muscle, those contractions are pro prolonged until what is called the plateau ends. So kind of jot down these steps. You have rapid depolarization, the plateau, and then repolarization. Again, very similar to the skeletal muscle contractions, but slightly different due to the duration. The conducting system now is basically going to support those contractile cells. And remember that the skeletal muscle, um, you know, doesn't contract on its own like the cardiac muscle does. It has that automaticity. So the normal pattern of activity is going to equal uh, the work of the atria contract first, uh, then the ventricles, which are controlled by the conducting system, or what is otherwise known as a network of special cells that initiate and distribute electrical impulses. There are two types of cells that don't contract that are involved in this conducting system. The nodal cells, which establish the rate of contractions, obviously they're located in these two nodes, and then the conducting cells that distribute contractile stimulus to the general myocardium, and they're found in the AV bundle, the bundle branches, and the pernicci fibers. Now, there is a very special nodal cell we need to talk about, which are your pacemaker cells. And our nodal cells are unusual because they do uh, depolarize spontaneously and they generate action potentials at regular intervals. Those action potentials are going to sweep through the conducting system and determine your heart rate. Now, the pacemaker cells are the ones that will reach threshold first, and they establish a normal rate of contraction. You run into problems when those pacemaker functions are not within that average rate of 70 to 80 beats per minute. Bradycardia is when you have a lower heart rate than normal at less than 60, and tachycardia is greater than 100 beats per minute. Uh, some cases you'll have abnormal conducting cells, which uh, may begin generating rapid action potentials that override the node's control, and these come from signals due to an ectopic pacemaker. Now, an electrocardiogram is going to help us determine this, and uh, basically, there are electrical events that are occurring in the heart that they're so powerful that it can be detected by putting these electrodes on the body surface. Each time the heart beats, the following is going to happen. You're going to have a wave of depolarization that radiates through the atria. It's going to reach the AV node, travel down the interventricular septum to the apex, turns, and then spreads through the ventricular myocardium toward the base. And that results in a P wave uh, when you have a depolarization of the atria. Then you're going to get an R wave. 
Um, that happens when the ventricles depolarize and that R wave is at the peak of this uh, act. And then the smaller T wave just coincides with the ventricular repolarization. 12.3 um, talks about the events during a complete heartbeat and a cardiac cycle, which is a period between the start of one heartbeat and the start of the next. This includes alternating periods of contraction and relaxation. For any one chamber of the heart, the cycle is divided into two phases, the systole or contraction and the diastole or the relaxation. Now the systole is a contraction, chamber squeezes blood into an adjacent chamber or into an atrial trunk, pressure rises, it's followed by relaxation or the diastole, which the chamber fills with blood and prepares for the start of the next cycle, but you're going to have pressure fall. And this is how fluid moves. Uh, from high pressure to areas of low pressure. Now here is your cardiac cycle and I would like for you to go ahead and just write down the order of this at, right now in your notes and then we'll take a closer look at this in our interactive notebook later. Our heart sounds can be detected by a physician with a stethoscope. They listen for four heart sounds. Uh, the first one is the love sound, which is produced as the AV valves close and semilunar valves open. The second sound is the dup. It occurs at the beginning of the ventricular diastole when the semilunar valve closes. And the third and fourth are hard to hear in healthy adults, um, but they're associated with atrial contraction and the blood flowing into the ventricles rather than with a valve action. Now, we're going to talk about our heart dynamics and, or cardiodynamics, which refers to the movements and forces generated during cardiac contractions, and each time the heart beats, the two ventricles eject equal amounts of blood. Um, the stroke volume, or the SV, is the amount ejected during a single beat, which can vary per individual, and the cardiac output is the amount of blood pumped by the left ventricle in one minute, which is what physicians are more uh, concerned with um, when they're you know, looking for this uh, information. And that's because it indicates adequate blood flow. Without it, homeostasis cannot be maintained. Now, um, there was this Frank Starling principle discovered by these two physicians. Uh, they basically discovered that the more blood that's pumped in, the more blood that's pumped out. Uh, so the output of blood from the left and right ventricles is balanced under a variety of conditions. And this is basically the rule um, that proves that. And this is also due to the blood volume reflexes. Uh, lastly, the autonomic innervation uh, uh, talks about the heart rate that is controlled by our pacemaker cells, but it can be modified by our autonomic nervous system, primarily that vagus nerve. And uh, the effects on the heart rate will include responses to acetylcholine and norepinephrine. Acetylcholine results in lowering the heart rate, while norepinephrine increases it. A more sustained rise in heart rate will follow the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine by the adrenal medulla during sympathetic activation, which remember is your flight or fight or flight response. Finally, effects on stroke volume, a uh, same uh, stimulus, uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine released by the adrenal medulla increases stroke volume while the acetylcholine release is going to decrease the force of those cardiac contractions. Um, very last note, other hormones involved, thyroid and glucagon also act to increase forces of contraction before synthetic drugs were available. You would use glucagon widely to stimulate heart function. And then there are other various drugs that are now made today uh, that help with the contractility of the heart. Uh, some increase calcium and increasing force of contractions, while others are used to treat hypertension or high blood pressure and have a negative effect on the heart contractions. And that's it. A little longer than I wanted it to be, but uh, pause and play as necessary, and I'll see you guys later.